All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Evans Imagines. This is the ultimate um, finale of our series on negative mass antimatter. Uh, thank you for making it with me through all six hours of this rant, um, assuming that you have. And let's go right into it, talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about here, the bleeding edge. This is kind of the reviewing homework uh, part. So I'll keep myself full screen for a second, just so you can see my lovely and ever evolving face, which I, you know, it's tracing a nice descent into madness. Huh? Okay. Um, so first we're going to go over the relationship between negative energy solutions and the Dirac equation and detailed balance slash microscopic reversibility. Then we're going to examine again, those early universe simulations with graviton type negative mass antimatter. Um, then we're going to examine the dynamics of wormhole-like travel in this cosmological model. And finally, we're going to talk about how, unfortunately, the Death Star has become an engineering protocol. Sorry, prop <laughs> protocol. I've been watching a lot of NBA uh, COVID protocols and all. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed seeing my disheveled face. I promise I have taken a shower. I just look ridiculous. Um, I've been up for a while today. Okay, so let's share screen. And share this window. Glomp. And present. All right, so that's the summary of what I just told you there. I'm still figuring out lighting and stuff. So let's see. I forget if this actually makes it bigger for you or not, but it'll make it easier for me. Do -do 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 -do. Oh, no, go backwards. Come on now. Whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, so. Careful readers probably will have noticed a while ago when I was talking about the Dirac equation and when I was reformulating it and I was like, oh, okay, well, these two energy, these two solutions now can be identified as the um, matter and antimatter solution. There's still four solutions. Um, yeah, I'm not debating that. I'm not a mathematician. And uh, that's why I was comfortable being like, oh, I don't know what those are for a couple of years. Uh, but I came up with a good idea this summer about what they might be. And um, so, Let's talk about it. So these are the two that I had explained earlier. I told you about it. I was like, okay, well, if, if we imagine this energy is minus MC squared, but as a positive um, energy, right? Because the mass itself is negative so that this winds up being a positive. Then, well, I'll play this because I don't think it'll get us a takedown, but what are those? Oh, come on now. What? What are those? So that's my question here. Uh, what are these? What are these solutions? Um, uh, on Wikipedia, you can see that's where I've gotten these from. Um, they're associated with the idea of a negative H bar slash a different uh, time dynamic, right? They, they will be the backwards in time solutions of our forwards in time solution or corresponding solutions of our forward in time solutions. So that's kind of my... Okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. I'll stop looping this video and hopefully continue to move on. Okay, so my idea is that the, um, they just represent the time reversibility built into the most fundamental equations. So we have microscopic reversibility. It shows up a lot in important equations and statistical mechanics and other, um, you know, parts of science, and we should have it in the Dirac equation. I don't think we have it in the existing interpretation of the Dirac equation. Um, but the reason that you haven't seen any work from me on this, despite I did figure it out, you know, a few months ago, is that I was beaten to it. Um, so there's this paper by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce people's names, De Berg, Pettit, and De Gastini. Um, she, these guys are doing great work last three years. Um, so yeah, their model winds up not needing uh, dark matter, dark energy. And specifically, they've found this exact point I was talking about. So on evidence for negative energies and masses, uh, the Dirac equation through a unitary time reversal operator. That's a long way of saying, if you do require time reversal symmetry, you wind up with negative mass. Now, I don't really agree with their conclusion about negative energies, but I'm not going to split hairs. This is almost all of what I was talking about when I talk about how it's related to uh, uh, microscopic reversibility. So I'm not going to publish a paper where I'm like, oh yeah, but they have positive energy, you know, just rehashing what we, how we uh, view the situation differently. 
Also, I'm not sure, like I'm not sure that they're wrong. Their biometric gravity is one of two possibilities I'm considering. Um, the other one is that there's just one metric gravity and it's, it's not ever a real thing. It's always an approximation. So um, I think that my version has no negative energy. It has no, um, but it still has negative gravitational mass, no negative inertial mass. So that's how I get around some of the problems here. Uh, but it's a great that they're on to something. They're the first people with a completely extensive model of the cosmos that has no dark energy and dark matter. So, I mean, you guys did great. Uh, if there is any, um, you know, uh, justice in the world, you guys will all eventually win prizes. So um, that's kind of what I think is happening here. Like, I think that PT symmetry in the Dirac equation is what we're observing when we talk about those next backwards in time solutions. We have to have the exact equivalent of what went forwards in time going backwards in time. So currently in the present model, matter is the only thing that can go forward in time. So once you send something backwards in time, it becomes anti. So time reversal symmetry is not maintained by the current feynman stuckelberg interpretation of the Dirac equation. Um, and I think that's a big problem. For me, that's the, uh, the nail in the coffin. Like even though Quantum electrodynamics is a big positive in the coffin. Okay, it's not a good opposite of nail in the coffin. A good uh, chit in favor of, of uh, that interpretation. That's not enough. That's not sufficient. That's just you know um, one possibility. So we've seen this time reversibility in a lot of different um, contexts classically. And uh, so it makes sense to me that our basic quantum mechanics equations should also preserve the symmetry. A lot of them do. This one didn't, so with that interpretation. So I think let's just re reinterpret it. And I don't really have a lot to say because as I mentioned, I've been beaten to that one by that Pettit Lab. Congratulations, guys. Nice work. Um, okay, so this is another thing I've already talked about a little bit before. Don't worry, there's a lot of new stuff coming. Uh, eh, kind of wild stuff. Uh, but we had talked about last time, these um, Miller, Chardon, Rue, uh, and uh, Manfredi had this wonderful um, paper about doing the early universe with 1D Vlasov dynamics. And the, uh, the first figure looked to me like the, what happens in the universe. You start off with everything together and it just, it segregates matter and antimatter because they attract each other and they repel, uh, sorry, they attract like matter and repel unlike matter. So you wind up with exactly what you'd expect. And also if you look at like the phase space over time, the velocities of the two streams are going apart, implies an acceleration. So I think there's a lot to be done with that um, approximation. And uh, yeah, I've, I've said this enough now to myself that I've begun doing the calculations. Uh, they're hard, it's gonna take me a while. It's like a PhD level thing. Uh, so if we do go backwards though, we are eventually gonna have the problem of the correct choice of attractive force. Now, this is another thing where I feel like we have a problem with physicists that needs to be addressed. And the problem is they don't know chemistry. This problem is an intentional problem. It comes up as a result of physicists in their training, traditionally being better at math than chemists since like 1975 in you know, the United States or in Western education. So it's a weird thing where like there's a, if you're good at math, you keep doing physics and stuff and you wind up being pretty light on your training in chemistry. And specifically your knowledge of intermolecular forces is like high school level you haven't had it again like i went through all of these physics classes you know at mit 801 802 803 804 805 806 yeah never comes up it's not coming up not coming up in grad school classes and when i was looking at plasma physics from um the you know they have a different ground up they're not building, in the, like, they just assume that in plasmas, the inner part particle forces must be explained by ionization and Debye model, blah, blah, blah. Guys, you gotta, you gotta use the models that are relevant to your situation. And here you can't just reinvent the wheel. We have a wheel, it works. The wheel is intermolecular forces. They will also be interparticle forces. Anything that has a dipole will have a dipole-dipole coupling. Anything that has, doesn't have a dipole, will have an induced dipole. Polarizability is a non, it's a fact of nature. If you have charge and it must be distributed, then it will be polarizable. So that force goes as one over R to the six is the other part of this equation. So that's the thing that sticks out to me every time I look at this problem. 
is, okay, are you having trouble figuring out what your strong coupling is in a plasma or what is going on in the early universe when things are very close together? Have you tried the one thing we know works on earth for condensed matter situations? Now, granted, like sometimes you have a liquid plasma transition and it's not clear what's going on there. So that's why they're calling it a fourth state of matter. But I think it's just because they're considering liquids only as I've seen the word um, superfluids. What's so super about them? Well, you can ignore the chemistry. You can ignore the internal friction caused by the van der Waals force. So I don't think that's so super. And um, so I just would prefer regular fluids and the things that actually happen to them. Um, so dipole-dipole coupling will dominate in the case of a dipole or in the case where you have electrons, protons, neutrons, quarks, things that we don't think have fundamental dipoles. That doesn't mean we can ignore this force. It means there will be an induced dipole. If this thing exists and it has a spread of charge, it has a polarizability, it has an induced dipole. There will be a regime where this force dominates all others. It is one over R to the six. Anyway, so I, I, I wrote this a while ago saying I'd wait another month. I've already started now trying to find a version of this Vlasov dynamics code that I can find, that I can get you know, the model going myself and calculate specifically what it implies for inflation. We should be able to get a curve for the change in inflation over time and what it implies for the baryon photon ratio of the early universe. So we'll have those pretty soon, he says, in January of 2021, 2022. And uh, so you will yeah, know how well I did on that whenever you see these, presumably by Googling it and seeing if I have done my early universe simulations with Vlasov dynamics. I probably haven't. It's going to be hard. Uh, unless, please, if you're one of those labs, get in touch with me. I would love to work from already having the code, then I can easily change it, you know. Okay, so on to the next point of uh, early universes solved. Now we want to get into wormhole travel. So I say wormhole-like travel because, you know, I, I don't really think we got a real space time. I don't think we really have Einstein-Rosen bridges, but I do think we have the equivalent. I think we have something that allows us to get propulsion from our surroundings and that allows us to get propulsion that we have not paid for in terms of local jet propulsion stuff. So here I have demonstrated the uh, patchwork universe in a hilariously cartoonish way. We've got our matter uh, little bubbles. These are, our, I guess, galaxy clusters in our current understanding, but whatever the biggest like matter unit turns out to be. And then you've got your unlike matter units. Now, granted, these should be 3D instead of 2D and all that, but this is just, you know, you get the general idea of what I'm trying to say here. What forces are the rocket feeling versus what it would feel in a normal situation? Well, whoop. so a rocket, let's just now send it between two, um, between a matter and an antimatter cluster, the absolute closest ones to the rocket, you can ignore the other ones to a first approximation and um, we're sending it head on. So in that case, you can see that the, you'll get a repelling from the um, antimatter and a pull from your, the place you're coming from, your matter area. So it's not just both things pulling on you and you reach the middle and then this one pulls more, it's their opposites. So you have twice the force to overcome in terms of gravitation going from here to there, which means you should have mm, twice the escape velocity it might be a square root in there. Uh, so twice square root of two, two squared, something like that. But somewhere between root two and four times the velocity would be required for escape. Uh, yeah, probably should do that math and write it down somewhere. But my point is that we've replaced a cancellation of forces with a push and a pull. And when we take this in the non-tangential direction, well, I guess we'll get there in a sec. This is my least favorite part of my current theory. I should let you know when I encounter something that has made me feel uncomfortable when I discovered it and that I can't get rid of. So we're made of matter. Half the universe is made of antimatter. If my current like series of assumptions and a priori guesses are correct, then that means there are half the universe where our fictional Star Trek Enterprise or whatever rocket cannot even dare to travel. If we got there, even a spacesuit would explode. There's no way for us to go hang out and, and talk to those aliens in any physical way. We could maybe send letters to those aliens and stuff, a la Feynman, but I, and I don't like it. I don't like being trapped here. Um, 
it's a necessary consequence, however, and it makes the rest of the things fall into place. No dark energy, no dark matter. Dark energy is gravity. That's super nice. Hyperinflation immediately explained. I'm seeing a lot of positives here. So I'm sticking with it, even though I don't like this consequence. And I would also note that the problem's a lot worse for the Dirac, Milne, and Bondi Einstein derived theories that have the antimatter in the gaps because there's a lot of gaps. And if you ever want to cross any gap, you can't because your, your spaceship's going to be burned up by this low density antimatter that you assume is there, uh, eating it up very slowly, unless you presume it's there just enough to cause all the pushing, but not quite enough to eat up all your spaceships. I don't know what they would say. Um, yeah, but like I say, since I don't like it, but it's been years now that I haven't been able to get rid of it, I'm more than confident it's correct. Whereas like some of these ideas, you know, they're reinforcing my initial um, predilections. So like I, I had the idea about the antimatter light being the same as matter light because I knew it was true in physics. And then when you couple that with the repulsive gravity, you can kind of get that like, I, I knew what we were going to see for dark energy, dark matter pretty fast from the, from the assumptions. I didn't get this right away. I had to think about this for a while. And once I got to it, I was, didn't like it. So um, I have a single use engineering concept uh, for a spaceship that could penetrate antimatter galaxies. Um, but I don't think they're giving out patents for that right now. I don't think I'd be able to enforce it. It's definitely not worth my whatever $10,000 to, to patent it. So the, the basic idea is you would have a matter shell on the outside, an antimatter middle shell, and then I guess a matter, then antimatter, then matter, right? Because we can only interact with the matter on the inside and our initial atmosphere has to interact with the matter on the outside. Then when we get to the antimatter galaxy that we're traveling to, that outer layer will disappear, the matter core, and we'll be left with an antimatter ship with a matter core. And then when we come back, the antimatter layer will dissolve and we'll be left with our matter spaceship. Yeah, but that's a long way off. Requires us probably mining asteroids because of the amount of permanent magnets it requires. Um, yeah, I'm not sure the degree to which this engineering idea is a, a real idea versus a fun sci-fi concept. And in any case, it's a long way off. We, you know, we haven't even discovered where these the nearest cluster is. We certainly don't have anything that's going to travel there yet. But conceptually, I needed to be able to explore it, right? Like, I don't want to have no go regions or whatever. I want to have regions that you could get to. It just take a lot of engineering. Um, yeah. So if we do ever find evidence, by the way, that our little probe crafts are consistently at some distance disappearing, huh? Uh -uh. that's a clue. Clue, clue, clue. So keep an eye out for that, guys. You should be seeing it eventually. I don't know. I don't think it's traveling very fast right now that we've like I say, Voyager has gone point zero 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 five. Mm one less zero, only nine zeros and then a five um, megaparsecs. And we need it to go five before we expect it to explode. So if it's exploded now, it's probably not because it hit an antimatter galaxy. Uh, okay. So the, the there is, however, the possibility that if we do have a lot of our tangential going right to our nearest galaxy um, rockets exploding, that we may be able to find an angle at which we are between the antimatter galaxies, right? Because you get low enough, right? The, the positive, if we're talking about density and we're allowing mass to go to zero, it goes from positive mass to negative mass through a zero, no mass, right? So that's a cool little, that's a cool little boundary you can always define, right? Because it has to go from positive to negative. And when it has to go from positive to negative, there is a zero. So we have a cool little boundary that number one, I think, is how we are going to eventually be able to normalize the graviton. But number two, it allows us to plot a path along that boundary because along that boundary, and I've given it a cute little four galaxy cluster definition here, obviously initially you have the problem where you're being pushed by everything and pulled back to where you came from. But once you reach the halfway point, you're being pulled to where you're going and pushed towards there as well. So just as you had a double escape velocity, you are now traveling twice as fast as you otherwise would be, which I don't know, is that a wormhole? It's faster travel than propulsion gives you. So maybe that would be interpreted in a traditional theory as a wormhole. Yeah, it's uh, it's a big stretch though. Um, so yeah, if you are good at uh, math, maybe help, help out with this one. This is definitely still in the, uh, I don't know, this is a fun little lark stage of, um, yeah, what are we going to do with this, right? Like it's going to be forever until we find even this. So why am I going to go to this? This is like 
the engineering problem for people are they even people like they will they will have evolved for so many generations that i'm sure they won't be understanding what i'm saying right now but hopefully they haven't blown up the earth i don't know yeah so as i've mentioned a couple of times in passing throughout i just wanted a unified theory of everything that's why i got into this i thought dark energy dark matter obviously a problem obviously we're calling them dark because they are not encapsulated by our current understanding of the light and how the light should interact with stuff. Um, but in constructing that unified theory of everything, I got a dang Death Star. So uh, yeah, I'm such an idealist. I didn't see this for a very long time. Must have been at least four years of looking into this. And it was in a popular science book. I forget. I think it was Z's book on gravity or maybe one of those Russian guys. Anyway, uh, the, probably a Russian guy, because so we have a couple of recent, relatively rare Earth events that are generally, generally, I mean, by uh, enough other people than me that there are Wikipedia pages about it um, associated with antimatter asteroids. So number one, I don't get it. I don't understand how that antimatter made it all the way from wherever it did to here. I guess if you think about like mostly space being one flat plane, something gets up and comes down or something out of the plane it might not encounter enough matter and i mean space is mostly empty even when it's got a diffuse amount of whatever hydrogen or something so maybe if you had a big enough thing shot fast enough out of an antimatter galaxy it would come in here now it should be tailing a bunch of gamma rays right eventually once it goes through the zero and into mass territory i mean <laughs> i have drawn it like this um the actual function is probably more like this, right? That goes to zero for a long time and then to negative, right? So it's possible that that misunderstanding in my just liking to draw out little, I don't know, what is that? Cosine, cautious or something is the problem in my thinking here. But anyway, so aside from the fact that in my current theory, I don't really want there to be antimatter asteroids. Um, there is some evidence that we have been hit by a couple of uh, recently in the last couple hundred years. Um, so the first one is the Great Chicago Fire. Number one, if you've heard the story about the cow tipping over the lantern, give me a break, dude. That's obviously fiction. Uh, it's cute. It's a nice, fun story. It also leaves, you know, nobody with blame. And it also doesn't explain that there were a number of other associated fires around the Great Lakes that exact night, which is crazy to me. Like, <laughs> gotta have an explanation for that. So the, my thought is that there was a big astro antimatter asteroid that broke up over the Great Lakes somewhere. And the reason you don't, didn't see a tidal wave, you didn't see uh, asteroid impact is not that it went splash, because if it went splash, it would have caused a big tidal wave, but that the antimatter pieces were themselves just they would burn the atmosphere from the top down, slowing down as they go, right? Because the earth is pushing more and more and more. You're getting closer and closer to the surface of the earth. Now, granted, uh, point particles are what I think of as. So I'm, I'm thinking of the earth as a big point point and it's approaching the point. And so the R is getting tiny. I know there's like, I'm going with the, the standard high school thought about gravity here. But in that thought, as your antimatter asteroid comes to hit, it'll slow. And as it slows, it'll, like the effect of it will burn, burn, burn more and more. And that's why you don't have an impact. Most of them don't make an impact, right? It would have to be really big to actually make an impact. And by the way, if it did, you're not going to like that impact. It's going to be a deep impact in the uh, parlance of our time slash the movies that I enjoyed growing up. Well, it, it wouldn't be a deep impact. It would be a shallow earth shattering impact because I mean, as it penetrates the earth, it will still be forced by more and more of the earth away from the earth so uh anyway um the other one is there was a uh, thing called the tunganska event so i had never heard of this you probably haven't either go google it uh but yeah this was before like conception i mean it's 1908 so einstein had like three years before gotten the very basic concepts that would eventually become the idea for a nuclear bomb but we know that we were not anywhere near like it took a whole manhattan project in the 40s i don't remember exactly yeah probably 40s to finish that right like it took a long time it took 40 more years of development so whatever happened here was not a nuclear bomb it was not an atomic bomb for sure and the strength of it appears to be modern h-bomb level so we're not even talking 40 years of development this is at least 70 80 years of human development ahead of time the the strength of this explosion and there is no there's no asteroid like there's no crater 
So generally when you see these events, like they create a huge caldera crater thing that you can find and becomes like a fun thing for people to go tourist around it. But is caldera a thing with volcanoes? No, I shouldn't have mentioned that. But my point is they didn't find that impact crater there either. And that's the same reason, right? You have a big asteroid coming in causing a big nuclear explosion fire all across the surface, getting more and more diffuse as it goes, vaporizing all the atmosphere, killing all the animals and people. Yeah, that's a sad part. Um, but yeah, what did that? There's no conventional explanation for the Tagunska event. It doesn't even really work with conspiracy theories. Because as I mentioned, like unless you think that was like a failed nuclear bombing by an ancient alien or something. No, come on, guys. I mean, number one, I will say that I probably don't think both of these events were antimatter asteroids. If so, why did they happen 40 years apart? And then once we got better at measuring stuff, there hasn't been another one for 110 years. I'm not asking for it. Don't, don't give me one, you know, Providence. I would not like to be hit with an antimatter asteroid right here just to prove, you know, that you exist. And my wife did bring up, what about all those oceans, right? Because like maybe we just got lucky, Siberia. And I mean, the Great Lakes, it almost wasn't an ocean. So maybe there just have been these. And in an ocean, there's nothing to burn. And there's no impact to cause a tidal wave. So fair point. N nice one, Susanna. Thank you for listening to me. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that would kind of explain it, right? Like 70, 30, it will be hitting the water. So if we think every 40 years, like is the minimum time, then... Let's see, there should be, for each two on land, we would expect about six or seven on water. So, but still, I mean, seven times 40, 280 years from, okay, fine, that's pretty far in the future. Well, good, we got, we got another couple of human generations before we can be ex, uh, expected to be killed by whatever random antimatter asteroid. Like, we don't even have a good gauge on our real matter asteroids, so we definitely don't know when it's an antimatter asteroid. Um, but Generally speaking, the point here is bad. It's real bad, uh, super, super, super bad. And the H-bomb, you think that's bad? Check out the anti-H-bomb because yeah, it's real bad. It's, it's real, way worse, not way war, come on, way worse. All right, back to, you know, I don't like to leave slides wrong. So again, full credit to the Bitstring Physics guys and particularly HPR Noise for establishing a working group at Slack to prevent antimatter weapons. Pretty cool. And also full credit to the movie Angels and Demons for bringing up that these exist. Um, granted, that's full fiction. That's not even really sci-fi, I, I wouldn't say. No offense to Dan Brown. But the movie did a pretty good job like of explaining, or not explaining, but showing the general issue with it. Also kind of, for me showed how you could build like my idea about building a um a spaceship probe with a, like a rocket that's like got layers of antimatter and matter that's first going to be used not as a spaceship probe right that's going to be first used as a weapon yes everything in here will first be used as a weapon um and my my only caveat i didn't put in the uh angels and demons movie clip here you can google antimatter bomb angels and demons and see the minute of tom hanks running away from an explosion and yeah, that it would be a bad explosion. You, and the one, my one caveat is if it were an enough antimatter that you could see it like you can in the, um, the movie, it would kill everybody there. It, it's not high enough up in the air to not completely burn everything on the ground for like 100 miles. It would have to be a very, very tiny amount of antimatter to do what it happened in the movie, probably not visible. So maybe we just say, okay, what you're visualizing there is the field and the actual amount of antimatter was a very tiny amount in the middle. But yeah, that's my only caveat to the movie, which was initially in the corner, but I was like, eh, they probably have a thing for that. So I didn't put it in here. Um, to explain to you what's going on here and why it's such a big problem, the main issue is the lack of a chain reaction, right? So first of all, you're only eliminating one or a neutron or something, and you're eliminating it via a chain reaction, either a fission chain reaction or a fusion chain reaction. And at best, you're not getting full um, the full extent of your uranium is not being used up. We have the problem of what to do with our leftover enriched plutonium, uranium, the stuff that doesn't finish in these reactor cores. Our current stuff it in the mountain, you know, cure is not a great one, but it's better than leaving it out of the mountain. So good for Yucca. Um, but yeah, the point is you only are using a small fraction of your substrate when you do your normal nuclear bombing. And an anti-H bomb 
uses the whole substrate. All gone, all turned into bomb. No chain reaction. The chain reaction is its existence, and it all happens real fast, completely guaranteed, at the same time. So while the per nucleon energy is no different, I mean, when you eliminate one or another um, a neutron or something, that's still one neutron energy equal mc squared, whatever, going away. The per gram or per molecule, mole, whatever energy is multiplied significantly because they are all going away. Like it's all exploding, all exploding all at once. Now, about a factor of 100 is my guess just from the chain reaction factor, but you also have that you're getting all of it, right? You're not just doing a little piece of a 239 mass unit thing that you're getting rid of. You're getting rid of 100% of the thing. So I think it's a little bit more than 100, which is the traditional multiplication factor people uses, but let's just use 100 to be conservative. This also sucks. And I should have probably brought it up before not liking that I can conceptually not get to one half the universe, dang. Probably more of a pressing concern that this allows us to blow up our entire earth real fast. And yeah, so I was recently um, brought, I, I didn't know about these experiments until I was on the phone with McGovern the other day. And he mentions, oh yeah, we're getting a lot better at containing antimatter. And I was like, I don't, I don't know about this. I don't like this. I don't want us to be containing antimatter. Don't like it. And so I looked it up. He's totally right. Uh, base step, Puma. These are two experiments CERN started in March of last year to essentially move antimatter between labs. So to contain a little bit of it, take it from the LHC to some other labs to share it around in a van sized thing. Oh boy, guys, guys, guys. I mean, like, it seems like this is being done without an acknowledgement that this is a significant problem, that this is a significant step towards a world destroying weapon. And I just want to make sure that like the, the legacy of HPR noise is not, not lost here. Like that was an important thing he was doing to constrain research on an antimatter weapon because yeah, I think I had another slide. Let's see. Yeah. The only application of an antimatter bomb is complete planet annihilation. So it's not like mutually assured destruction. We don't need multiple bombs to assure everybody is destroyed. It's one bomb destroys everything, assured destruction. So I think the only saving grace is that the repulsion of the weapon from earth, um, right? I mean, like if you had a bare weapon, then like a bare antimatter bomb, it would start flying up immediately. So, you know, you'd have to release it pretty deep to cause any damage. But as I mentioned, you could have an, a magnetic core of antimatter in a matter shell that then breaks apart and releases it deep in the earth. Yeah, as was intended in the angels and demons example slash my weird engineering problem about rockets in antimatter space. Uh, I did a little math here. I didn't put it in. I, I did the math a while ago to see whether or not the distance away you could be in a geosynchronous orbit. Um, could you shoot a payload from that gun that would hit the earth. Um, yeah, that would hit the earth because it's being pushed up the whole time, right? So at the time I hadn't figured out the engineering problem. And the answer was, yeah, you could fire an antimatter bullet with conventional muzzle velocity that hits the earth from a geosynchronous orbit, AKA the Death Star is an engineering problem. Yeah, mathematically it works out. You could have a thing up there, big circle, making a bunch of antimatter, dropping a bomb, dropping it, you know, shooting it because it's not, being dropped. If you dropped it, it would immediately destroy your ship because it would be pushed back. Well, presumably your ship has a core made of antimatter. So if it got out of containment, it would destroy your ship. But you have to fire it at the earth because it's going to be being pushed up immediately back at you. So, but it is possible. We have muzzle velocities with rifles and such here on earth already that can achieve the speed necessary to shoot the payload that would destroy the earth. So yeah. That would suck, but as I mentioned, that's not how you would actually deploy this kind of bomb. You would put it in a mine shaft with a timer and it would be like in those old movies, Die Hard or whatever. You'd have to stop the timer to not destroy the world. Um, so yeah, if there's one thing to take away from all this, it's uh, please, people, if you know anybody working on Base Step or Puma, reconsider your experiments. Please do not do this. Please do not put antimatter in a van. Please, 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 please. I don't care. I, I understand you're doing it for scientific purposes, but any advance you make in containment of antimatter outside of a lab is exactly the advance that is necessary to make an antimatter bomb that destroys the planet. 
please don't do that. Please stop it. Please don't do base step. Please don't do Puma, at least until you know whether or not it's going to fall up or down. Like you don't know anything about antimatter right now. And the stuff you do know is it would be a really great weapon. So anyway, I think there's significant security concerns in base step and Puma. Um, and yeah, I would encourage CERN to please uh, prioritize other of your antimatter experiments, keeping it underground, keeping it contained. Well, hmm. I guess we have to work on what is the upper limit to the amount of antimatter that we're going to be able to create. And is that amount, are we ever gonna know about whether or not it falls up just by virtue of like, if we make too much of it, if we make enough of it to tell whether or not it falls up or down, we might be making enough that it would explode the world. So, uh, yes. Well, I do appreciate everybody working on the alpha G and G bar and Aegis experiments. I want to see some working papers on the ramifications of antimatter weapons and the amount of antimatter necessary versus the amount we're currently making versus the amount we would need to tell to five sigma certainty about antimatter falling up. I think we can probably make enough of it to see like a little bitty of it go like that, uh, you know, in a gas stream with just vaporizing local electrons and stuff. But I don't know for sure. Uh, it's, it's obviously like a trade-off. As you create more and more of it, it will explode more and more things along the way, so forth and so on. So, that's basically the end of, oh, I did add the Death Star. You'll notice uh, throughout the entire class, I didn't put Death Star on the list, uh, but Death Star is pretty important. And yeah, uh, I had to include it. And I am sorry that it has made me reconsider whether or not we should be doing these antimatter experiments at all, because it's like a planet destroying weapon that we're potentially making. Okay, so that's, that's it. I mean, you've reached the end of my rant. Um, Congratulations to you. Thank you to uh, who I assume are mostly my family and close friends who have stuck with me through all this. Um, on the plus side, we established a theory of everything, extended the electroweak theory to gravity, uh, gauge theory, and I have eliminated the following assumptions and paradoxes. No more dark energy, it's just gravity. No more dark matter, it's just a wrong extrapolation from only positive masses. No more symmetry breaking, no more anthropic principle. Those were just stupid and bad philosophically and you should have known better. Four, no hyperinflation. It's just a result of things used to be closer. Now they're further away. Five, no strong CP problem. That's just a virtue of you had a matter and an antimatter quark. If you don't have them, no CP problem. Uh, and then finally, the baryon photon ratio, although I haven't exactly shown it, I've hand waved enough that I'm confident about it. All right, there's probably some more on this list, but those are the ones that I find the most convincing. On the minus side, we invented a stronger weapon than anyone that currently exists and have constrained our possible travel to half of the cosmos, which is. Not great. So I feel a little bit positive because, you know, there's a lot of positives on that theory side. But in terms of like, what do we actually create here? I'm feeling like we might be, uh, might be come death, destroyer of worlds. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that was a way overstatement by Oppenheimer when you think about this weapon. So um, I think it was Oppenheimer. Anyway, but we, we need to have some serious thought. We're not even having a Manhattan project now. This is all happening out in the open. And as a result, I worry that we're not taking the security concerns seriously enough. Okay, so that's basically it for this series. As I mentioned, I, I kind of settled on, I'm going to do uh, the natural selection problem in humans as my next series. I might start it today. Um, essentially, I'm putting biologists on trial. Uh, I'm giving them their Nuremberg. They never had it. They're still using all the Nazi stuff. And I'm going to call them out. I'm going to say, hey, these equations you're using, Nazi equations. These are literally what the Nazis believed that made them do the things they did. So we have to come to a better understanding of ourselves than the Nazis did if we're going to ever have biology and social science exist together. Because currently the central dogma is the way that, that biologists are laundering in social Darwinism. And it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable at all. And it's very gross. So we're going to have to talk about how um, biologists are generally inheriting a lot of Nazi math and they need to redo their math with better assumptions. Uh, it's going to take a while. I don't think six hours, maybe more like three or four. Um, secondly, inner particle plasmas in, or forces in plasma. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of work on this before I pop that one out, but it's not a new state of matter. Anytime you have somebody telling you there's dark, so that's how I knew natural selection was wrong. They say dark, um, what do they call it? Dark genetic matter or something. They do some weird, well, it's just like in physics, we're real smart. And that, you know, I'm making fun of biologists now. And I was saying part of the problem is for plasma physicists, they're not taking chemists seriously enough. So I will admit, Got to take biologists seriously. Their concept of differential reproductive success 
is important and needs to be refined, but it is not a concept like fitness. Fitness is, is Nazi. We need to talk about what fitness is and what it is not. Um, so anyway, we're, we're going to talk about that at some length. You can tell I'm pretty impassioned about it already. Um, but yeah, and, and so just like you have the dark genetic matter, and that's your clue that we need to look at that more for some Kuhnian advances, that's the same thing with plasmas. They talk about it being the fourth state of matter and stuff. Oh yeah, really? Well, have you tried all the existing ones? Oh, you didn't? You didn't try the existing ones? So that's the, the point of our entire rant on plasmas is that they haven't, like physicists like the idea of a non-interacting liquid, they call it a superfluid. You should know by the terminology, when somebody calls something the good one, they're implying they don't like the bad one. They don't like the non-superfluids, right? They don't want to think about it. And so they're making all these extrapolations that are all very wrong. So uh, hopefully I'll have that idea in somewhat of a, a better form. But yeah, uh, it's been very nice talking with you all. Let me stop the screen share so that I can give you a little talk to the camera. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this extended rant. Uh, if you'd like to work together on something, shoot me an email, bonee at alum.mit.edu. I've appreciated the people of you who have so far. I've, I've already had some very interesting thoughts about um, whether or not my thesis work can be applied to some of the, uh, was it, earthquakes and stuff. Thank you to Dan Brox for that. Um, and yeah, just shoot me an email if you have an interesting idea and you feel like you're onto something that's going to be causing some sort of a revolution in your a uh, local part of science. I'm I'm up for thinking it over and, and reading it through because I know that you're probably getting some bad bad comments from your reviewers. And uh, yeah, that don't worry about that. Those guys, they got grants, they got H indices. And if you didn't cite them, you're not helping their H index. So they're not probably going to give you a positive review. So that's what that's about. Don't worry about it. And uh, yeah, have a good time. I hope you enjoyed negative mass antimatter. I hope you go, go forth and uh, and think about it. Go forth and solve some of these problems that I put out there that I just, I don't know the solutions to it. I, this is not a final theory. I mean, this is like me grasping at straws to explain dark energy and dark matter in terms of what I see in the sky, right? I mean, I see the stars out there. They, they're not moving very much. They're not moving visibly. And to the extent they are moving, it seems like they follow this Hubble relationship. It's very simple. It doesn't require very much of um, a new theory. So yeah, I hope you like our new our new paradigm. I hope you will join me in shifting over to negative mass antimatter. And yeah, thanks for joining me. And I'll see you in the next series of Evans Imagines. Bye, guys.